HMS Tiger was a battlecruiser of the 1911 estimates, being part of a larger group of British battlecruisers commonly referred to as the Splendid Cats. Tiger was powerfully armed with eight 13.5 inch guns and a speed of 29 knots. Tiger joined the Grand Fleet as part of Admiral David Beatty's 1st Battlecruiser Squadron in October 1914, and participated in some of the more notable engagements in the First World War, like the Battle of Dogger Bank, being hit at least seven times in that engagement in January 1915. She was also there for the Battle of Jutland, where, more famously, she was hit upwards of 20 times, with two of those shells penetrating the rearmost turrets of Tiger. And like some of the other battlecruisers like Queen Mary, Indefatigable, and Invincible, these hits did not lead to a catastrophic powder fire, and Tiger survived the battle. Following the battle and repairs, she continued to participate in the war, helping in the Second Battle of Helgeland Bight. After the Great War, she continued to serve the Royal Navy until 1931, when she was paid off and then the following year she was sold for scrap. Tiger was the single battlecruiser provided for the 1911 estimates and was the last battlecruiser the Royal Navy laid down before the start of World War I. Tiger was originally supposed to be a ship along the same lines as the Queen Mary from the previous year, just updated. However, there were several changes and advancements in technology the Royal Navy had adapted to other ships, and therefore they chose to change the design of Tiger throughout 1911, where R.A. Burt summarizes the changes as compared to Queen Mary. 1. Relocation of Q turret abaft instead of before the third funnel, where it had a considerably wider arc of fire. 2. Provision of a 6 inch instead of a 4 inch secondary battery. 3. Addition of two extra torpedo tubes at stern. 4. Extension of belt armor at extremities and slightly increased horizontal armoring. 5. Rearrangement of boiler rooms to accommodate new location of Q turret. 6. Substitution of single pole mast for full tripod. Suppression of main mast and an addition of derrick stump fitted close before third funnel. 7. Protection to secondary armament increased from 3 inches to 6 inches. 8. Design speed increased from 27 to 29 knots. Tiger was laid down on June 20, 1912, launched on December 15, 1913, and completed in October 1914. As designed, she displaced 28,100 tons. In reality, with a deep load, she was closer to 34,000 tons. Her machinery consisted of 39 Babcock and Wilcox boilers, giving steam to Brown Curtis turbines, the first of this type fitted to British capital ships, giving her a design shaft horsepower of 85,000 and an actual shaft horsepower of 104,635, with an actual top speed of 29.07 knots. As for her armament, she carried eight 13.5 inch 45 caliber guns and twin turrets, two forward and two aft. 12 6-inch 45 caliber guns and casemates around the ship, two 3-inch quick-firing guns, one 12-pounder, five Maxim machine guns, ten Lewis guns, and four torpedo tubes. At the same time, her armor consisted of a main belt of 9 inches, with ends varying between 3 inches and 6 inches, bulkheads of between 2 and 4 inches, barbettes with a maximum thickness of 9 inches, the main battery turrets had a face thickness of 9 inches, 8 inches in the rear, and between 2 and a half and 3 and a quarter inches for the roof and sides a conning tower of 10 inches, and a control tower of 6 inches. R.A. Burt summarizes Tiger's design very well when he writes, As completed, Tiger represented a distinct improvement over Lion and Queen Mary, but the protection was still inadequate to withstand heavy caliber shell fire, and when the ship was compared with the German Deflinge in all-around efficiency, Tiger was not generally regarded as an equal, despite the heavier armament. Tiger joined the 1st Battlecruiser Squadron with construction workers still on board in October 1914. Tiger did carry out trials, but not to the extent she would have in peacetime. She drilled and practiced through the coming months, and even became part of a controversy between Jellico, Beatty, and the Admiralty. Where in November 1914, following the loss of the Dreadnought battleship Audacious, Jellico was concerned about his numerical superiority in Dreadnought battleships. BD-2 was worried about his numerical superiority over the German battlecruisers, as three of his battlecruisers were being sent off to hunt for Admiral Graf Spee's East Asia Squadron after their victory at Coronel. BD and Jellico insisted that the Admiralty should not send one of BD's splendid cats, as the loss of one of these powerful battlecruisers to BD, as their numerical superiority was very slight or non-existent. Instead, they insisted an older battlecruiser should be sent like New Zealand, the Admiralty suggested Tiger should go instead of Princess Royal, the ship the Admiralty wanted, and Vidi insisted, The Tiger is unfit to fight. Three out of four of her dynamos are out of action for an indefinite period, and her training is impeded by bad weather, which
which might continue for many weeks at this time of year. At present, she is quite unprepared and inefficient. Rogelico said she would simply be a present for the Germans. So the Admiralty, understanding the concerns of their admirals, took Princess Royal, inflexible and invincible, and sent them to hunt Admiral von Spee. Not only that, but Beatty was concerned about the effectiveness of Tiger, as she was new with a less than adequate crew who had low morale, including some captured deserters, as a consequence having some of the worst gunnery in the Grand Fleet. Tiger and her crew went through some extensive drilling in November and December, and would not fare great in a face-off that was not too far off, the Battle of Dogger Bank, which lay ahead in January 1915. Following the raids on Great Yarmouth, and specifically Scarborough, Hartlepool, and Whitby in mid-December of 1914, in the unsuccessful attempt to catch the German scouting groups, Beatty was given permission to make his permanent base at Ross Scythe in the Firth of Forth as to be closer in case of a German attack, which came in late January 1915. Admiral Franz von Hipper, commander of the German scouting groups, was to carry out an advance on the Dogger Bank, using the battlecruisers Zeidlitz, Moltke, Deflinge, and the large armored cruiser Blucha. The light cruisers Rostock, Strassland, Kohlberg, and Graudenz, along with two destroyer flotillas, leaving by 5.45 p.m. on January 23rd. Through successful decoding by Room 40, the British were aware that the Germans were planning in advance. The Admiralty, under Winston Churchill and Jackie Fisher, decided that a joint force would be suitable to intercept the German ships, setting a rendezvous for 7 a.m. on the morning of January 24th, 1915. Sending out telegrams at 1 p.m. on the 23rd to Jellicoe, Beatty, and Tirrett, which reads as follows. Four German battlecruisers, six light cruisers, and 22 destroyers will sail this evening to scout on Dogger Bank, probably returning tomorrow evening. All available battlecruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers from Ross Scythe should proceed to rendezvous, arriving at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Commodore T. Tirrett is to proceed with all available destroyers and light cruisers from Harwich to join Vice Admiral Lyon, BD at 7 a.m. at the above rendezvous. If the enemy is sighted by Commodore T while crossing their line of advance, they should be attacked. Wireless telegraphy is not to be used unless necessary. The Admiralty's plan was set in motion. BD's five battlecruisers, including Princess Royal as she was under his command, and Goodenough's four light cruisers coming down from the Firth of Forth, would meet at dawn with Tirrett's three light cruisers and 35 destroyers. While order pre-dreadnoughts and armored cruisers positioned themselves 40 miles to the northwest of Beatty to intercept Hipper if he turned north. Jellica was to be further northward, ready to intervene if the high seas fleet sailed out. After sailing, Beatty's five battlecruisers, Lion, Princess Royal, Tiger, New Zealand, and Indomitable, reports came pouring in early on the 24th. Wilson Young, serving aboard Lion as a lieutenant, has this to say. The eastern horizon showed light, but it was still dark night about us. At 6.45, signals were beginning to come in from the Harwich Flotilla, indicating that the rendezvous chosen by the Admiralty had been hit exactly. At 10 minutes to 7, I went down to breakfast, and when I returned 15 minutes later, the daylight was beginning to spread and the cloud banks to roll away. It promised to be an ideal morning with a light breeze from the north-northeast, and a slight swell on the sea. At 7, the bugle sounded action. At 7.20, a signal from Aurora, one of Tirrett's leading ships, reported that she was in action, causing Beatty to order the battlecruisers southeast at 22 knots. On the other side, Hipper spotted seven British light cruisers and more than 20 British destroyers from the northwest of his position, running on a parallel course, out of gun range. He understood that this was no mere patrolling force, and at 7.35 a.m., he signaled that his entire force should turn to a southeasterly course and run for home at 20 knots, and if necessary, up to 23 knots, the top speed of Blücha. Hipper soon sent a message to the commander-in-chief of the High Seas Fleet, Admiral Friedrich von Ingenol, and the High Seas Fleet would put to sea later that morning. By 8 a.m., the chase was on, with the British forces pursuing Hipper on a parallel course. Tirrett and Goodenough's light forces attempted an attack, but it was ineffectual, and Beatty ordered them to stay out of the way as the battle became a straightforward, stern chase where he hoped to destroy the enemy by long-range gunfire. Speed in this engagement became the key to success. On the bridge of Lyon, Beatty turned to his chief engineer, Percy Green, and said, Tell your stokers all depends on them. Green responded, They know that, sir. Beatty continued to ask for more and more speed. Eventually, by 8.54 a.m., he signaled the battlecruisers to a speed of 29 knots, something that the older New Zealand and Indomitable could not do, having a design top speed of 25 knots. Beatty was willing to take the risk of fighting Hipper, three ships to four, if that meant he could catch up to the Germans. 
By 852, the first ranging salvos were fired, and soon Blücher, the rearmost German ship, was being straddled. By 905, Beatty made a general signal to the squadron to open fire and engage the enemy, and the 13.5-inch guns of Lion, Princess Royal, and Tiger began sounding out. Lion hit the last ship in the German line Blücher, with both Tiger and Princess Royal also concentrating on her. As the battle developed, Beatty gave instructions at 935 to engage the corresponding ship in the enemy's line. His intention was for a ship-to-ship -ship distribution of fire. Lion should take on Zeidlitz leading the German line, his second ship Tiger should fire at Hipper's second ship Moltke, and the third British ship Princess Royal would engage Deflinga, and New Zealand would continue to hammer Blücher which became difficult about an hour or so later at 1040 when Lyon began dropping back as she was taking a beating from the concentrated German gunfire. Massey has this to say about Tiger. As Lyon began to drop astern, Tiger next astern drew abreast and began to pass her, and now Tiger became the primary German target. She was hit on the roof of Q turret in the intelligence office, where eight men, including Beatty's fleet engineer, were killed, and the boat stowage area between the two after funnels. The ship's boats were set on fire, and the blaze produced plumes of flame that rose above the tops of the funnels. Seen from the other ships in the squadron, Tiger looked like a roaring open furnace. The blaze caused the Germans to believe she had been sunk in the battle, and reported so when returning to Wilhelmshaven. A little while later, Beatty ordered a turn because he had thought he had spotted a submarine, which I go into more detail about in my video online, link in the description. This order caused an immense amount of confusion for the British, and in part helped allow Hipper's battlecruisers to escape this battle, because Lyon was so badly hit, Beatty was no longer able to communicate and command the battle effectively, and so command turned to Sir Archibald Moore in New Zealand. And through trying to interpret Beatty's course northeast and attack the rear of the enemy, he thought that meant to attack the ship that was on the compass bearing northeast. And so at 11.09, Tiger, Princess Royal, and New Zealand ceased firing on the fleeing German fleet and swung to join Indomitable in the final destruction of the already doomed armored cruiser Blücher, thus breaking off the action. Tiger did not perform particularly well in the battle. R.A. Burt has this to say about her performance. She engaged Blücher, Zeidlitz, and Moltke. She was hit seven times, the port gun and B-turret disabled, the signal distributing office wrecked, one officer, nine ratings killed. Her performance at this action has been recorded as being far from satisfactory, which was probably because she had not been fully worked up. After her somewhat disappointing performance, Tiger went for repairs, and there really isn't much to say in the time between Dogger Bank and Jutland, so let's get into it. On May 30th, Admiral David Beatty left the Firth of Forth between 10 and 11 p.m. with the 1st and 2nd Battlecruiser Squadrons and the 5th Battle Squadron. By the early afternoon on the 31st, Beatty had made it to the agreed rendezvous point along the Long Forties, close to the Scandinavian coast. That morning, the High Seas Fleet, under the command of Admiral Reinhard Scheer, left Wilhelmshaven, with the scouting groups under the command of Admiral Franz von Hipper, weighing anchor and leaving at 3 a.m. A Tiger midshipman who was asleep on the deck of the battlecruiser remarked, We did not appear to be expecting the Huns, as we cruised along eastwards at no great speed. By 3 p.m., Beatty and Hipper were not too far apart. An initial contact between the battlecruisers was soon made, with Hipper making a turn to the south, understanding that Beatty intended to cut him off from his home base and that he could possibly lead a portion of the Royal Navy into the waiting guns of Admiral Scheer, a goal of the high seas fleet from the start of the war. Intending to close the gap, Beatty increased speed, leaving the battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron behind. By 340, the battlecruisers had formed a single line, with Beatty's flagship line leading followed by Princess Royal, Queen Mary, Tiger, New Zealand, and finally, Indefatigable. At 3.48, the German guns opened up the Battle of Jutland. Fire distribution was an issue for Beatty, as he intended for Lion and Princess Royal to fire on the leading German ship Lutzo, while the other ships followed along down the line, with Queen Mary firing on Deflinge, Tiger on Zeidlitz, New Zealand on Motke, and Indefatigable on von der Tan. Lion and Princess Royal fired on Lutzo as they should have done, However, Queen Mary fired on Zedlitz instead of Deflinge, meaning that she was allowed to fire unmolested for almost 10 minutes. Compounding the fire distribution issue was the fact that both Tiger and New Zealand fired on Moltke, putting up a withering barrage of fire. However, Nick Jellico has this to say in his book Jutland, The Unfinished Battle. Tiger and New Zealand did so at 18,100 yards, opening fire. Tiger was almost immediately straddled by two salvos from Moltke, one long and the other short. The very next minute, she was hit twice, once on the forecastle and the other on the shelter deck. 
A blinding flash through our gun port, and a rattle of a hail of shell splinters on our ship's side told us that Jerry was already straddling us with a near miss. Moltke increased fire to every 20 seconds, and three minutes later at 354, Tiger was hit again, this time a more significant hit. She was hit on the setting hood of Q turret, killing one officer and three men, and badly wounding many more. Petty Officer Fitzgerald, in charge of Q turret, thought that the turret could be brought back into action, when, very suddenly, amidst the deafening noise, our ship heeled over to the hammer of a tremendous shock, and my mind rolled and spun like quicksilver. Then she seemed to shake herself like a dog with a bloody nose, and then belted on at the top speed of the fleet. After Tiger's Q turret was put out of action, she was hit again at 355, and her X turret was temporarily put out of action. Both turrets were brought back into action later on. Tiger was hit nine times by Moltke in the first 12 minutes of the battle. Besides the after two turrets being put out of action, she was shrugging off the hits like nobody's business. There is one thing I need to make abundantly clear, which will cause a delay and break in our narrative, as I need to state how terrible Tiger's gunnery was. In the entire engagement, the overall Battle of Jutland, she scored, drumroll please, three hits out of about 300 shells fired. A clip from my video on Queen Mary will help in part to explain why Tiger couldn't hit the side of a barn. Before the Great War and during, an emphasis was put on gunnery speed, with a faster rate of fire being preferred over careful calculation. This obsession with speed led to unsafe practices like stacking ammunition outside protective magazines and leaving anti-flash doors open during drills or battles. Queen Mary's crew excelled at this speed school, being some of the fastest gunners in the Royal Navy. Okay, with that, let's continue on our story. Things for the British weren't exactly going great. Lion had been hit in her Q turret, which had almost caused the destruction of Beatty's flagship, and two ships behind Tiger, Indefatigable blew up at about 4.02, which although was not great, it was at least not an immediate threat to Tiger and her crew. What was, was the loss of Queen Mary at 4.25, forcing Tiger to turn hard as she was going 25 knots and only 500 yards astern of Queen Mary. An officer on Tiger's bridge had this to say about Queen Mary's loss. I saw one salvo straddle her, three shells out of four hit. The next salvo straddled her, and two more shells hit her. As they hit, I saw a dull red glow amidships, and then the ship seemed to open up like a puffball or one of those toadstool things when one squeezes it. Then there was another dull red glow somewhere forward, and the whole ship seemed to collapse inwards. The funnel and mass fell into the middle of the ship, and the hull was blown outwards. The roof of the turrets were blown 100 feet high. Then everything was smoke, and a bit of the stern was the only part of the ship above the water. The Tiger put helm hard to starboard, and we just cleared the remains of Queen Mary's stern by a few feet. After this occurred, the run to the south ended as Beatty reversed course after the loss of Queen Mary, and so the run to the north began. In the first part of the battle, Tiger was hit no less than 17 times, 16 of which were from Moltke. Tiger and the rest of the battle cruisers passed Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas and his 5th Battle Squadron as they came south to engage the Germans, not receiving the signal from Beatty to turn north. Beatty's ships were traveling at 26 knots to the north, and still continued to suffer. Lion and Tiger were hit by Lutzo and Zeidlitz, and Beatty steered to port to put off the enemy rangefinders. Most of the other battlecruisers had taken damage, except New Zealand. Beatty's ships maintained their high speed to put some space between them and the oncoming high seas fleet, turning northeast to try to rendezvous with the Grand Fleet. Just before 6pm, the run to the north came to a close, as Beatty spotted the advance guard of the Grand Fleet with the 5th Battle Squadron taking the brunt of the fire from the High Seas Fleet in this part of the action. Beatty and Hipper continued to duel. Soon, Admiral Horace Hood's 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron came into view, with orders to turn ahead of Beatty and take a position in advance of the Admiral. Accordingly, at 621, Hood led his 3 battle cruisers around through a 180 degree turn to starboard, taking station 4,000 yards ahead of Lion as well as Tiger and Tiger continued to fight against the German High Seas fleet through most of the night. Things started to pick back up at around 8pm after the death ride of the German battlecruisers, where Tiger and the other British battlecruisers spotted them. Just as the sun was setting at 8.12pm, all six British ships opened fire at what turned out to be four German battlecruisers. At 8.30, the plight of the German battlecruisers appeared to Riyadh Romov's pre-dreadnoughts. Seeing his chance for his obsolete vessels to assist in the battle, he ordered them forward, and they began taking the brunt of the gunfire from Beatty's battlecruisers, giving the German battlecruisers a chance to slip away, and Beatty did not pursue. After taking a beating in the battle, 
the Battle of Jutland was effectively over for Tiger. Tiger was battered pretty hard during the Battle of Jutland, taking 21 hits in total, and was still able to fight effectively in the battle, showing a toughness her half-sisters did not show. After the battle, she was repaired at Ross Scythe and rejoined the battle cruisers in July, where she became the temporary flagship of the battle cruisers while Lion received repairs. The remainder of the war was not exactly eventful besides a large refit in the winter of 1916, including a flying off platform for a camel. Besides some sorties to Helgoland, which I'll probably do a video on because they don't seem to get talked about much, after the war she served with the Atlantic fleet and was the temporary flagship for the battle cruisers again while HMS Hood worked up. In May 1920, she went to the Baltic with Hood to reinforce operations against the Bolsheviks which I will link to a video by Drakenefell about these British operations in the Baltic against Bolshevik forces. Tiger and Hood were recalled due to a policy change toward the Soviet regime. Tiger survived the Washington Naval Treaty and was used as a training ship with more refits and changes throughout the 1920s, even briefly coming back into service while Hood was getting a refit in the last part of the decade. After the London Naval Treaty, she was paid off and put into reserve in May of 1931, sold for scrapping in 1932. There's some speculation that Tiger could have been retained instead of another ship, maybe a dreadnought like one of the Royal Sovereigns, but it's not something that I'm going to go into. There is something to say about Tiger's toughness, as she certainly could take a hit but could not punch back, given her inability to hit her targets. Anyway, thanks for watching everyone, and a happy new year. I can't believe another year has flown by, and by the time I upload this, we'll be very close or past 10,000 subscribers. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for the support the channel receives. It's truly humbling.